Humans have been interested in how animals move since the dawn of humanity. I'm interested in how animals move. I study how animals move because I think they're beautiful, their structure and their function. But early humans had some more practical applications for understanding how animals move. With the advent of photography, we had the ability to start to stop motion, to see the individual elements that make up really fast motion. So Murray was this amazing inventor and physiologist in France in the 19th century. And he started off using um, multiple exposure photography like this to uh, look at animal motion. And then he did some very clever things. So this is one of, like, one of the first high-speed video cameras was this cassette. Um, you know, people were used to shooting birds, so he had it set up like a gun so you could follow the bird and actually get the first known um, atomization of the flight stroke of birds. Moving on into the sort of modern era of functional morphology, evolutionary morphology, we used high-speed cameras. Film, when I first started off, both high-speed regular cameras and x-ray cameras. And of course, it works fine with aquatic animals. You put them in an aquarium, you point a camera at them, works great. Um, so both regular and just x-ray movie images, fluoroscopy, cine radiography. Um, moving on to, to digital uh, high-speed video, which was a wonderful advent for those of us who ever worked with film. Way, way easier and um, now is the, is the standard. But there are problems with external view or even one x-ray camera. Um, so with external views, many joints are not visible. So if you look at that turkey, the hip and the knee are really all up in there. It's very hard to study them. Skin motion is really huge. I mean, even over the tibia, there's centimeters of jiggle in a lean person. It's just, you know, a centimeter at least. Um, so it really, it makes it hard to actually look at the details of what's happening with the bones and the joints. Um, and generally, the result of such analyses is a stick figure. And what we really want to see is the 3D skeleton in motion. And so Murray, again, was way ahead here. He had his multiple exposure photography, and he was trying to interpret what was happening inside this horse from that multiple exposure photography. So the solution to being able to see 3D bones in 3D motion is to combine two different sources of data. One is bone shape, bone models from something like a CT scan or maybe an MRI, mesh models of the bones, so static individual bone models, with bone motion from two x-ray movie cameras, biplanar video fluoroscopy, video radiography. And the, uh, through various techniques I'll get into, you animate the bones to match exactly what that person did the bones of that person or the bones of that individual animal. Um, and we, uh, our implementation of this at Brown, um, we've been calling x-ray reconstruction of moving morphology. Um, my colleague there, Steve Gatesy, pioneered the idea for animal research. Actually, he was developing it kind of in parallel with people doing it for human research in the 90s and didn't, we didn't know about each other. Um, and we chose this name because we really want to emphasize two things. Number one is the morphology. We are morphologists, anatomists. It, you know, this technique gives you all the detailed 3D bone morphology you can get from a CT scan, from a detailed mesh model. So there's morphology. And it's a reconstruction. So it's not a simulation. It's, um, it's a reconstruction. It's an animation, but it's not a cartoon. It's a very precise reconstruction of what that individual did those bones did in that trial, purely empirical. And so Steve started off with pigeon flying, and he wanted to reconstruct a skeleton. And Steve Gatesy, I don't think you know him, but he, that would be a very Steve thing to do. Yeah, so Steve, um, this great idea to combine these two sources of data, but he was doing it in a, in a really difficult way. And so we started doing it with, with biplane x-ray, which really, really helped a lot. So um, this is a uh, chucker partridge. Um, this is real time. This thing is running up an inclined slope and flapping its wings, doing what's called wing-assisted incline running, which is thought to be an intermediate step in the evolution of flight. Um, flapping the wings to run up, this allows wings to develop over time enough aerodynamic 
power to actually fly. Let's take a CT scan, make a model of all the individual bones. In this case, they articulate them and then animate that puppet to match what's seen in the two x-ray views. So it's like a key and a lock for that puppet to fit into the shadows that are seen in the two x-ray views. <clears throat> so the point of the study was to compare where with ascending flight. And Dave has made these beautiful visualizations that um, are from the perspective of the bird's body, right? So here's one of the things you can do. You can stop and have a camera that looks at the bird's body so you can see wing movement relative to the body. And then he's got five trials of each behavior here um, showing that, the, that the, there's variation but that the behaviors are different from each other. It's been, of course, applied to humans. Um, and that has to be markerless. The, the Chucker stuff, stuff, uh, studies were markerless as well. Um, and at Brown, we developed some software for doing um, the uh, animation of the bones in a, in a somewhat automated way, Autoscoper. Um, we're not doing further development on that. It is open source. We hope <clears throat> people in this community will take it up and do more things with it. There are also other options out there now as well for doing uh, automated tracking um, of bone models. Oops, that's this way. Yeah. Um, so uh, all of, whoa, okay, let's go back. Right, so um, all the things we've been developing at Brown, hardware and software, is all open source. And uh, we encourage people to use them, continue developing them, and um, take great advantage of, of these opportunities. So what I showed you before was markerless XROM. What, we, what I tend to do much more with animals is marker-based XROM because we can do surgery on them, we can implant at least three little metal markers per bone, animate the bones in a much more automated way than if we're relying just on the X-ray shadows. And so we did this study of uh, walking in turtles. And turtles are just a great subject for x-ray study because you just can't see inside them, right? You just can't know what's going on. Of course, the vertebral column is fused with the shell, so that's not moving. But the but pectoral and pelvic girdles are free in there to move. And so our question was, well, how much is the pelvis moving during locomotion? So we implanted um, uh, these... Um, in this case, I think it was 0.08 millimeter tantalum beads into the pelvis and the femur and the shell. And then we uh, track the beads and use, calculate the rigid body motion, use that to animate the bone. So we have the two x-ray views, we track the markers in both views, um, and then we animate the pelvis and the femur based on those motions. So this is kind of a, a butt-end view of the turtle. Um, and you can see that pelvis rotating around in there. And it rotates about what is it, 18 degrees. And what that does is it increases the stride length, just like when a lizard swings its pelvis back and forth. So this increases the stride length of the walking that they can swing the pelvis around inside the shell like that. So we did the marker tracking for this in XMA Lab, which is software we've been developing for marker tracking, open source. Um, and it's really, it's come along pretty far. We're a um, couple years into it. We have a publication um, validating it. And uh, both XMA Lab and Autoscoper are on Bitbucket and available for anybody to both use the compiled versions and take the code and make it better. So XROM, it's been great fun developing XROM, but it's been really exciting how it's let me go back to questions I've been interested in my whole career that um, I left, it turns out, because I really couldn't answer the questions I wanted to answer, really the morphological, functional questions. 
And so I worked on suction feeding in fish as an undergraduate and subsequently left that field for a long time until recently. Um, and I'll show you what suction feeding looks like. It's what it sounds like. Um, fish do this amazing expansion of their kinetic skulls to suck in their prey. And um, we're interested in how all those bones are moving to produce that expansion, um, but then also where does the power come from? This is a very powerful behavior. They're having to very rapidly accelerate water, and I didn't put it here. This is probably 10 times sped up. They do the expansion in about 20 milliseconds. Really fast, incredible behavior. And so we're interested in where does the power come from to produce that acceleration of water into the mouth. And the, the head muscles, which we think of as probably the ones that would be most involved, are really pretty small. And the body muscles, the hypaxial and epaxial muscles, attach to the back of the cranium and to the pectoral girdle, and they pull back on those um, so that they can contribute to the power as well. This has been known for a long time that they contribute something. But people thought, well, maybe it's just the anterior regions, and people have really focused a lot on this muscle down here, the, the sternohyoideus, as a, a main power source. Um, and so our question was, well, how much do they, these two uh, groups of muscles really contribute? And so uh, my former grad student and now a postdoc, Ariel Camp, um, started this work. I was pretty skeptical that she was able to animate all of these little bones, and she did an amazing job developing the surgical techniques and, and, the, and the animation techniques, and so we can animate all the bones you see here. And the body reference plane is really key, so we put some markers into the body so that we can measure the motion of all these head elements. One of the problems previously in studies of fish feeding is that everything is moving relative to everything else. And people would measure, like, how much does this one move relative to the cranium? Well, that doesn't do much good because the cranium is going up and down. And so having a body reference plane is huge, and that's been, been, been great. So here's the XROM animation. That's actually the right side of the fish, so you've got a medial view of all of those bones moving. We just do one side. It's already about 60 markers, so it's a lot. So here's a view with that body plane held steady. So you're seeing the motion of all the head elements relative to the body plane. And you can see a little bit of jitter in these. That's the noise. It shows you that these are real data. This is not a simulation um, with precisions better than 0.1 millimeter. And this is what is really exciting. This is what it lets us do we could never do before, which is measure the instantaneous volume change inside the mouth during feeding. So this is a technique that Ariel developed called a, a, a dynamic digital endocast. And so that polygon is, is measuring the change in volume of the mouth over time. So that's DVDT. And then we also measure the pressure in the mouth. We put a little pressure transducer down in there. And pressure times DVDT is power. So we finally can measure instantaneous suction power in a suction feeding fish, which is our first step toward figuring out where the power is coming from. So um, we have here um, on the right are the graphs of, at the top, mouth volume, and then rate of volume change, and then expansion power relative to time. And the gray bar is that period of maximum expansion power here. So volume, rate of change, and pressure, and then we calculate the, the power over time. So then we need to figure out what the muscles are doing. And for the axial muscles, we put little markers in the muscles and use fluoromicrometry, just marking, tracking the markers and measuring the distances, um, to measure those changes in length of the axial muscles. For the cranial muscles, um, those muscles have really no appreciable tendon, no compliance, no fixed end compliance. So we can just um, do the uh, MTU lengths 
to get the, the muscle length changes for those. But you can't do that if you have a tendon that is really is changing length. And we validated that by putting some little markers in to be sure. So then these muscle length changes, these graphs are, again, time on the x-axis, and um, in this place, muscle length on the y-axis. So going down is shortening and going up is lengthening. These are the two largest head muscles. And it turns out that they're lengthening during the peak power production. So again, gray is peak power production. They're really small compared to the axial muscles, but then also they're lengthening. So they can't be contributing any power. Whereas the axial muscles, the epaxials and hypaxials, are shortening during this maximum power production. And so the, the power is coming from them. So the odd thing about this, right, is that these axial muscles we think of as swimming muscles. They've always been studied as swimming muscles. But they're feeding muscles, too. And in fact, all this red area, I mean, they're, they're shortening, well, even further back than this, about two-thirds of the way down the body, the muscles are shortening and contributing to expansion. So what we have in the graphs are individual feeding strikes from three different fish with power on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. And um, what you see as the dotted line is the maximum the cranial muscles could contribute in power if they were fully active and shortening. But we know they're not shortening, the biggest ones. And so um, what they actually contribute is the red line, which is sometimes even negative in this individual. Um, so for high power strikes, this one we got the most high performance strike, we can say that more than 95% of the power is coming from axial muscles. And so that's, that really changes the way we start to think about fish, fish bodies, right? We really need to look at these muscles, their anatomy and function as feeding muscles as well as swimming muscles. So suction feeding is powered by swimming muscles in largemouth bass. But that's so far just one species out of 30,000 species of wraith and fishes. So I think this has really broad implications for wraith and fishes. Um, but we need to do a bunch more work now on other species to see how, <clears throat> how generalizable this is. So the next species we've gone after is the sunfish, uh, another freshwater centrarchid. Yeah, so sunfish. Um, and they're a bit different because they have much smaller mouths. And they have these very, what we call deep bodies in fish, but you'd think of as a tall body. So we went for these guys because they're closely related to bass and they have this very different body form. And so again, we have these relatively small cranial muscles, big axial muscles that we've now found are contracting all the way back to here during feeding. But this sternohyoidus is the largest of the head muscles and that's the best candidate for head muscles really contributing to suction feeding. Same methods as before, XROM, bone animation, cranial muscle lengths from MTUs, uh, dynamic digital endocast for the power, body, floor micrometry. And so here are all the results on one slide. Um, power at the top. The gray now is the entire period of power production. Volume and pressure that goes into that power calculation. Epaxial, hypaxial, axial muscles, and then here's the sternohyoideus. And so yes, the body muscles are shortening all through that power production, but so is the sternohyoides. Remember that was lengthening in the bass, but it is shortening in the sunfish. And so here we have uh, ex absolute expansion power again in watts, um, time, and the individual feeding strikes from two different fish. Um, this one got up to a maximum of about 10 watts, that one above 15 watts. And what you can see is that the maximum amount that the cranial muscles um, can contribute is in the red bar. So this one has less total power, so the, the head muscles can do a bit more, especially the sternohyoideus. Um, in that case, in both cases, body muscles have to be contributing to the most powerful strikes. But the, the end story here is that um, in this fish, uh, the sternohyoideus is contributing more than in the bass. So there, there is an appreciable contribution from cranial muscles. So comparing the, the bass and the sunfish, the sunfish um, has about twice the suction power on average. 
um, a greater con potential contribution of head muscles to that. Um, but the sunfish body muscle mass of the individuals that we used was about half of the bass. So on a per muscle mass basis, they're, con they're, they're generating about four times the power of the largemouth bass. So they're really better, higher performance suction feeders. And um, as I said, this gets interesting when we start thinking about the, uh, the shapes of the, the fish bodies. So this is a very tall body, and that tall body has always been um, attributed to swimming, that it gives them more maneuverability, or maybe it's defense, they're harder to bite. Um, but what we're realizing is it puts a lot more axial muscle in the best mechanical advantage for suction feeding. And so it may be, as we look at more and more species, that we really can explain a lot about the shape of all those many species of fishes based on the role of the muscles in feeding, perhaps as well as locomotion. So again, there are these deep, tall bodies, um, and we think those may be contributing to the feeding performance. But still, we have a lot of work to do. So we're, we're pursuing fish with um, all kinds of different body shapes in the lab now. Um, but it's still a pretty long process. It's probably six months at least per species to, to do this. So another area where I've applied XROM in my research, and again, something I was interested in for a long time before XROM came along and actually let me study it, um, which is how the ribs and intercostal muscles work in breathing. And um, this is something that's interested people for a long time. Leonardo da Vinci did dissections and found the internal and external oblique layers of intercostal muscles that um, have these, this alternating layer, external, deeper, internal, external, internal. Um, and the hypotheses for what these things do have gone all over the place. So going back to Galen, um, who was the, the Greek physician to the Roman gladiators, um, he thought from his findings of gladiators <coughs> cut open um, that the external intercostals were contributing to exhalation and the internal intercostals to inhalation. Leonardo da Vinci, who didn't know the work of Galen, um, did his own dissections and he concluded exactly the opposite. He looked at them and said, well, actually I think it's the other way around. And then every major anatomist and biomechanist through the ages has had a different point of view on this. And of course, the final conclusion has got to be that they both do both, <laughs> um, which, is, which is where we are now. Um, but it's, it's an interesting puzzle. Why is it so hard to solve? Well, um, the problem is that ribs have this really complicated 3D shape. Right? They have this curved 3D shape. It varies from um, superior to inferior. Um, and then each of those ribs moves in some three-dimensional way. Um, so they're complex shapes and complex motions. The, what's happening between each pair of ribs depends on what two ribs are doing, at least. Plus the whole thing is acting as a mechanical unit. So it, it makes sense that this is a hard, hard problem to solve. It's also tailor-made for XROM because what XROM gives us is bone shape and bone motion. And then if we have that, we can map the intercostal muscles onto it and measure how they're changing length as well. So um, it's a hard problem, and I think getting bone shape and bone motion is really, really helping move it forward. So here's a human rib cage. I haven't actually worked on humans, by the way. We'll get to lizards in a minute. But, um, uh, and uh, here are the external and internal intercostal muscles with the externals removed to show the internals. So you also have this amazing muscle architecture of the intercostal muscles on top of that, right? So you have this swirling uh, fiber angles as well. Um, and I have a long-standing interest in muscle architecture too, so that it's really feeding into this. And, but what, one thing that seems pretty clear is that the costal cartilages, or they're called sternal ribs in other animals, and the parasternal intercostal muscles, internal intercostal muscles that attach to those are very important in breathing in mammals, in humans and dogs. When dogs run, um, most of the muscles of the rib cage get recruited into 
a locomotor pattern, but these parasternal intercostals always retain the ventilatory pattern. That's very nice work um, by Dave Carrier. And so uh, these parasternal internal intercostals seem really important for inhalation. And so I chose to study this in lizards because lizards lack a diaphragm muscle or any other accessory breathing mechanism. They have to rely totally on their ribs for breathing. And so I thought that might give us more insight because we don't have to have these other accessory mechanisms going on at the same time and we might get really big motions. So green iguanas, we implanted metal markers into their ribs. We had to put them on little metal posts. You can almost see that here. Um, yeah, these little metal posts because the ribs are so thin we had to stick the posts in the, in the bones instead of the beads in the bones. Um, but we still get very good precision and accuracy. Do the x-ray movies. This one doesn't happen to be marked. But you can see already really big rib motions. I mean the whole area behind the armpits there just collapses and expands when they're this animal we we ran it around the racetrack for a little while and then put it in front of the x-ray and it stood there <laughs> breathing heavily so it's all I also I wanted to see big motions no matter what we did so it's all I study all deep breathing I used to call it heavy breathing but I got in trouble so um, <laughs> now we call it deep deep breathing so the ribs of um, actually most amniotes other than mammals are made up of two segments that we need to animate separately. So the dorsal segment is the vertebral rib, that ventral green segment is the so-called sternal rib, and there's an articulation between them. So we, we animate those as separate elements, the vertebral ribs and the sternal ribs. And so here are the, the motions animated, they are indeed very large. And we did indeed find that there's motion between the vertebral and the sternal segment. There is motion at that intracostal joint. And so we had the animations from three individuals, a bunch of breaths. And so then we sacrificed those individuals, opened up the skin, and used a 3D articulated arm digitizer to map the intercostal muscle fibers of that individual onto its own bones. So we have the intercostal muscle fiber orientations for the different individuals, which vary, which is interesting. Um, and uh, so we did three different areas, the external intercostal dorsally, the internal intercostal dorsally, and then these parasternal intercostals uh, down ventrally. And I want to talk about those muscles um, because they seem to be really a key to ventilation. And, the interesting challenge, um, it's actually sort of similar in suction feeding, is in this case you need muscles to expand something. And muscles only do work while shortening. And so it's kind of a problem. How do you use muscles to expand a cavity? And the, the basic answer is lever systems. <laughs> Convert shortening to expansion. Um, but this turns out to be a, an interesting and to me not very intuitive lever system because it's particularly hard to think about how do you use muscle fibers that are between two ribs to move those ribs apart from each other? But they can do it. So let's look at that. So first of all, are they really? Are they actually shortening during inhalation? So we have the animation, those little um, check, little green crosses are mapping the muscle fibers onto those bones. You can see they're moving apart during inhalation. That's inhalation. So that we measure the length change. Here's exhalation. The ribs are folding back and getting closer together. And then they come forward and move apart from each other. And when they do that, so now that's maximum exhalation, 1.4. And then as they expand, you see that that muscle fiber is getting shorter, 1.3, 1.2. That's the diagonal, very strong diagonal muscle fibers. That's another feature of fibers in this area is they're very strongly oblique. So 
So these uh, intercostal muscles lengthen during exhalation, shorten during inhalation, but they move the ribs apart because the ribs are acting like a parallelogram with pin joints at the corners. So the pin joints here are easy to understand where it articulates with the sternum. It's articulating with the vertebral rib at the top, and the vertebral rib is apparently somehow keeping those apart. Because if it didn't act with pin joints, they would just move together. But it, it's actually holding them at a, a constant, um, not a, yeah, a constant distance from each other um, to make a parallelogram. And when you when this animal is exhaling, that parallelogram kind of collapses on the left there, and the diagonal gets longer. So the fibers lengthen during exhalation, and then they shorten during inhalation and lever that parallelogram up and the two sides away from each other by some perspective. I mean, another perspective, they're the same distance all the time, but if you do a straight line, uh, the straightest distance between them, they're getting further apart. And so it's actually kind of a similar mechanism to a scissor jack. It's a great way to convert muscle shortening to expansion. And I always think breathing is fun. Breathing is fun because to study because, um, well, this, this fundamental bio biomechanical problem of how do, you, how do you use muscles that shorten to expand something. But also because it doesn't seem like it should be so difficult. Right? We think, you know, you think about breathing yourself. You don't have to think about it, but it's this really complicated mechanical system that also interacts with locomotion in very interesting ways. And so that's also a next step for this research. We have, when we've been working on all these different animals, we, um, we have, uh, we collect locomotion at the same time, but we haven't gotten to analyzing that yet. So to summarize from all the muscles, there are indeed these craniocaudal and dorsoventral gradients in the function. So it's not just inspiration or expiration for external or internal. These um, dorsal, external, and ins internal uh, intercostals are inspiratory, but especially these parasternal internal intercostals. They have a really huge mechanical advantage for the um, expansion. And then the expiratory muscles, to the extent that, that intercostals do contribute to exhalation, they tend to be more caudal. Um, but also there's the abdominal muscles, the transverse abdominus in particular, that's contributing to exhalation. Exhalation is simple, right? You just take muscles, surround a cavity, and squeeze. It's, it's the inhalation that's more mechanically difficult. And interestingly, um, this has been studied to some extent in humans and dogs before um, any of this model-based um, type of analysis was started by doing um, static CT scans and mapping muscle fibers on and looking at it um, in both dogs and humans. And I was really surprised when I looked carefully at that. that they basically find the same thing that we found in the lizards in terms of um, which parts of the rib cage are contributing to inhalation and exhalation. So that was that's surprising to me and really kind of exciting. So now we've also studied all these other species and marching along. So we're doing this um, deep, I just have to catch myself, deep breathing first in all the species. And then we also have locomotor data. And so we'll see the interactions between breathing and locomotion in these species as well. And um, And then, the, so the final thing I'll say about this is, again, um, breathing or the thing that's so great about XROM is it gives us both the shape and the motion. If we didn't have the shape and the motion, we wouldn't be able to map these muscle fibers. But then there's also a whole lot of ongoing analysis about what rib shape means. And so what, what does it mean to have more curved ribs versus less, less curved rib, ribs? How much um, gradation is there along the trunk in the articulations? and um, and in the, the amount of costal cartilages and things, it's, it's, there's a lot to do. So uh, at Brown, we've been um, developing a lot of software, but also hardware along the way. 
Um, so the first system that we worked with and, and developed was based on sea arm fluoroscopes, which are really great, especially for zoological research, because they can handle mostly a pretty small volume, a soccer ball or smaller. Um, and the powers are the x-ray power is not that great, but they're relatively cheap. So $200,000 for a complete system with of refurbished sea arms with high-speed video cameras. Uh, so that's the main modification is putting on high-speed video cameras instead of the usual 30 frames per second cameras. And then we also um, worked with an engineer, Marty Coolis, at um, ISSI, something, uh, Imaging Systems and Services International, um, to develop this, this uh, biplanar x-ray room. Um, which has a lot more flexibility. So we put a wind tunnel in there, we put in aquaria, we put in trackways and treadmills, and um, all four parts, the image intensifiers and the x-ray tubes can move all over the room and, and be in a huge wide range of orientations for all these different kinds of studies. And so that's why we've been able to study everything from a, a mini horse to, well, not guppies. The guppies are just too small. We do not put those in the x-ray machine. Uh, but, you know, some relatively small fish. <coughs> and uh, the availability of biplanar x-ray hardware has really grown in recent years. And um, uh, they're currently, I would guess, this was the last time I counted, was October. And if people know of systems, I actually have a, a website where I keep all this information and people can look at the systems that I have listed there and then see, make sure the ones you know about are on there. So, Come see me if you want that URL. Um, so there are about probably 35 systems now, and uh, at least 20 of those are based on our design. So there are about 10 CRM systems for mostly zoological, but also some human work, um, and about 10 of the, the larger room systems based on ours, and then others that have lots of um, design elements from all over the place. So um, I want to thank all the people who have contributed to this. It would be an, a huge, endless slide. I'd go on for another 20 minutes if I uh, included all the, the students and postdocs. I'll just mention my colleagues who've been really central in this and some of our funding. Um, so Steve Gatesy, I mentioned at the beginning, had this, this fundamental idea for animal research to combine the bone models with the x-ray imaging mo motions to, to make this um, 3D bones moving in 3D space. Um, our colleague Dave Beyer was a postdoc with Steve and me. He's now at Providence College, and he was really critical for um, all the initial marker-based uh, programming. He's actually a biologist who taught himself to code in MATLAB and coded it. It was amazing um, when we were just getting going with those sea arms. Um, my colleagues Tom Roberts and Sharon Swartz in uh, ecology and evolutionary biology at Brown with me, animal biomechanists. Um, Kia Huffman is a, a programmer who's done all of our database work. Ben Knorland's a, a software engineer who um, uh, created XMA Lab and also um, did a lot of work on Autoscoper. And then, of course, our colleagues at Rhode Island Hospital, who all along, while we've been developing this for animal research, have been developing it with their applications for human research. So Trey Crisco, Doug Moore, and, and Braden Fleming. And thanks very much for the invitation to come speak here. And I hope I've left a bit of time because I'd love to hear from you all. So yeah. So we uh, yeah we do have time, plenty of time for questions. But I'd ask that people come to uh, either that mic over there or this mic here, and I'll get things started. Um, while people walk up with their questions. Uh, Beth, thank you for a fantastic talk and uh, thank you for uh, coming to join us. Uh, as you talked about the power production of the fish when they're in jaw opening yeah. to, uh, to create that, um, I started thinking about uh, the, the fish we saw yesterday on campus in the varsity pond and, the, and how uh, the temperature of fish mussels changes dramatically throughout the, throughout the year, at least it does in Colorado. And, and how that uh, affects behavior. Obviously, muscle velocity would be, would be reduced in cold temperatures and uh, increased in uh, warm temperatures. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so certainly suction feeding slows down. There's been quite a number of studies of fish muscles that show that they slow down. So suction feeding does slow down um, in colder temperatures. 
But luckily, what they're going after are muscle-powered prey. And so the prey slow down, too. So it's all kind of, kind of OK. <laughs> A very beautiful talk. Thank you very much, Walter Herzog from Calgary. I was just wondering, it seemed the implication was, like in your suction feeding and then also with the locomotion aspects and the breathing, that uh, when the muscles are shortening, that they're also actually active, and when they're lengthening, they're not active. That seemed to be the implication in power production. So I was wondering if you ever measured EMG in conjunction with that to verify when the muscles are actually active in these, in these various uh, things that you analyzed. Yeah, absolutely. So for muscles to generate power, positive power, they have to be both electrically active, generating force, and shortening. Um, and so yes, we do EMG to confirm that they're active. And in fact, in those fish muscles that are lengthening, they're active lengthening. So they're contributing negative power. That's those little... what I actually thought would happen. Huh? I actually thought that might happen. Yeah, yeah. So um, yes, they, they are everything in the fish head is electrically active practically all at once. Even the jaw closing muscles turn on like 15 milliseconds after, 10 milliseconds after the opening ones. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, so yeah, those muscles that are lengthening in the fish head are active lengthening. Uh, like different muscles they're using because of that air versus not having to worry about air. I, I don't know too much about fish. Right, so. no, that, that's okay. <laughs> um, so I think the question was about um, about feeding and feeding in air versus feeding in water and how that might relate to breathing. So fish, fish really don't have any conflict between feeding and breathing because um, when they suck water in for feeding, they're also pumping that water back out over their gills. So it effectively is just like a huge breathing mechanism. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I hadn't really thought about it this way before. Um, also fish just have a lower metabolism and don't have to breathe all the time. We, you know. um, but then, yeah, in, uh, in um, amniote feeding, especially mammal feeding, um, generally, swallowing and breathing generally can't happen at the same time. Um, and so, yeah, there's special mechanisms in the soft palate that keep those, that keep those separated. up here, I guess I get to go. Um, Melissa Gross, University of Michigan and proud alum of the University of Colorado. Um, my question is about uh, your animations. They're gorgeous. I imagine they're very labor intensive as well. So are these essentially case studies of a species or is it in your plan at all to try to scale some of those models to bigger fish, bigger lizards, or do you have to go in and do it all over again? If you if you move to another species, um, that's a great question. So we do have broad comparative aspirations. So part of our project that I didn't talk about has been a big um, database and data repository project. So we've created the um, X-ray motion analysis portal, which um, is a data management system for um, XROM type data that encourages all the users to store and document their data in the same way um, so that they are potentially reusable for comparative studies so that um, it'll make it easier and it already is making it easier as we go forward um, and have multiple species to be able to compare them. So that doesn't exactly answer your question, um, but that, that's how we'll, as we do all these individual case studies, how we'll combine them into comparative studies and we're just, you know, it's about 10 years in, we're getting to the point where we have multiple species and we're starting to do the comparisons. It's pretty fun. Um, but your question was, was more interesting than that. It was, are there more clever ways to do that, to extrapolate, to scale from particular case studies? Um, and yes, so uh, I would recommend attending the talk of Aaron Olson, my postdoc, who's speaking this afternoon, um, because that's one of the things that he's interested in, is taking these XROM data on suction feeding in fish, developing models based on those, and then being able to go to a, a natural history museum question, a nat natural history museum and collection, and measure a whole bunch of morphological features of hundreds or thousands of species and then apply those models. So we are hoping to come up with some general principles about 
what is it about morphology that's related to whether you use your body muscles or your head muscles or both, and whether you use your ventral muscles or your dorsal muscles, and um, he's hoping to then expand that out more broadly um, based on morphological comparisons. Hi, back over here. Uh, Jonas Rubinson, Penn State. Um, first of all, thanks for a, a really wonderful talk. Uh, for someone who has spent, uh, I think, far too much time putting little reflective markers on various animals, I'm very impressed and, and really very envious of your, uh, of your systems and your, and your work. Um, I have a question about the, the catfish work. Uh, and I might have misunderstood the, the, the slide and the, and the graph, but you had plotted uh, muscle power uh, per mass of muscle, and I think it was up at something like 10,000 watts per, oh, okay. per kilogram. And I was right. just wondering if there's something. Yeah, so, um, so in that, that was in the, in the sunfish, and what that was intended to show was that um, that scale was intended to show that those muscles couldn't be doing that. Ah. that um, so that um, in the case of the axial muscles and those, say, 15 watt power productions, they were up around um, some of the higher power productions you would expect, 400 watts per kilogram for the axial muscles. Um, but the cranial muscles were around 10,000, meaning they just couldn't do it. That was the point of those scales. Um, okay, so. So, so is there some kind of power amplification happening? Or is so that's a great question. Is there power amplification? It's a, it's a wonderful question. So are they somehow, um, uh, pre-storing some elastic energy that is then being returned to amplify the, the power production of the muscles. And we really don't see evidence for that. Um, so it, we don't see any pre-shortening. We are measuring shortening. Um, the EMGs have been measured exhaustively for these species, and we don't see early activation. And so there, there doesn't seem to be any power going into the system prior to the motion. And so we need to do some muscle physiology, but it, it, it's not, uh, the very most powerful strikes were, we're including the, see it's including both that big sternohyoideus muscle, which is contributing, and the axial muscles, we're down around 300, maybe, you know, we're getting in the range of, of reasonable watts per kilogram. But it, it, that's a great question about power production. Oh, and I will say, uh, power amplification, uh, uh, seahorses and pipefish do that. They definitely do power amplification. And you see, you see uh, pre-activation and shortening of the epaxial muscles prior to, there's a catch me mechanism that holds the head down, and then they snap the head up and do these really powerful. So it happens in fish. It just, we don't see any evidence that it's happening in these fish. Hi, I'm Andrea Hamrick from uh, Queen's University in Ontario, and uh, I also really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, I was interested in, in the um, uh, animation, the study of the turtle and the pelvis and how the pelvis moves, and I was just curious as to whether you noticed um, movement of the pelvic bones um, sort of within the pelvis itself, so the innominate bones, and um, if you studied that in other animals or noticed motion. Right. There. Um, so, not in the turtles, so the, 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 the pelvis seems to be a really nice fused element. But actually we're moving on to pectoral girdles and those are separate. Um, but in the turtles, no, the, the, it seems to be a fused, a fused element within, point, within 100 microns right. precision. <laughs> um, hello, I'm Dennis Anderson from Boston. Um, Really, really interesting and cool stuff. Um, I, I wanted to shift over to the, the breathing studies a little bit. Um, it was uh, interesting um, for, for the iguana, it seems sort of like, I don't know if for a lizard, the right anatomical direction, the, sort of an abduction of the ribs. Um, but in a human, that anatomically, the, the ribs don't really move that way. It's more of a rotation. So how do you think that would affect the, the muscle um, action for, for ventilation. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I didn't go into the rib kinematics, the 3D rib kinematics, because I wanted to have time to do this, because this is yeah. the fun part. Um, but rib kinematics is really nice terminology, old terminology for 3D rib motions. There's, um, there's bucket handle motion. Right. Um, and and so the, the lizards are doing almost all bucket handle. There's pump handle motion, and so we do a lot more pump handle. 
elevating our ribs. Yeah. And then there's, there's caliper motion, which is, would be moving out this way, which um, some animals do as well. And there's always some of that mixing with these to kind of keep everything articulated. So um, we found in the iguana, it's almost all bucket handle. Mm -hmm. In monitor lizards, it's about equal bucket and pump. In tegu lizards, it's, um, I think it's closer to equal bucket and pump. Snakes use a lot of pump handle. So um, there's definitely variation in, um, in those 3D rib kinematics. And yeah, it has huge implications for how the intercostal muscles are doing that. Yeah. Um, and um, one, the, the, the one thing that, um, that lizards appear to lack is any muscles that run from the vertebral column to the ribs that could be doing the rib elevation motions. They really do seem to be relying on the intercostal muscles and the attachments up to the pectoral girdle, sort of pulling the whole thing forward. Um, but snakes, interestingly, have, have a convergent levator costa muscle. So humans have a levator costa. But they have a muscle that runs from the vertebral column to the each individual rib that can actuate each individual rib separately. Um, oh. And that allows, you know, snakes have, are all ribs. That's all they have. <laughs> and um, that allows them to really move different parts of the rib cage separately. The, the rib cage doesn't have to be a single mechanical unit the way it is in lizards and us. OK. Just out of curiosity, have you looked at uh, rib movement in a turtle? Uh, well, ribs and turtles. Uh -huh, are <laughs> how, how do they do? How do they? They're fused move? to the. They're fused right. to the shell, so they don't move their ribs. Um, so turtles so are how really do they interesting. Expand their lungs. Yeah, um, turtles are an interesting case. So they have modified some of the oblique muscles into diaphragm-shaped muscles. So at the, especially at the back, the back leg. Pits, the last <laughs> leg openings, there are these cup-shaped muscles that are derived from the oblique muscles um, that flatten out and hmm. uh, pull the air in. Yeah, it's and, and it's, it's hard to think, how do you get there? Like, yeah. it's one of those evolutionary problems of what's the intermediate, you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah what, and what, how do you, there almost has to be an alternative breathing mechanism in place before you can fuse up your ribs into the shell. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to have to stop on questions, but I thank Beth for uh, allowing so much time for questions. Let's thank Beth for a fantastic talk. And thanks to all of you for great questions, yeah. fun, fun questions. Thank you.